if you believe in the community that you're in with NFTs, it's like, just because Bitcoin dumps, does this mean that Board Ape is going to go down? I truly don't know. Uh, if it buys you real world access to cool things, why would that value drop in Bitcoin? It doesn't really make sense. Welcome to Profit to the People, the official podcast of Republic, where we believe you have the power to invest in the future you believe in. I'm your host, Lisa Carmen Wang, and I'll be taking you behind the scenes to meet the team, founders, and investors in our community who share their insights on the future of investing and how they're bringing profit to the people. To learn how you can invest, head over to republic.co and follow on all socials at Join Republic and at Lisa Carmen Wang. Today, we are talking about NFTs, also known as non-fungible tokens. NFTs have taken the investment market by storm in recent months, and we've seen things like Jack Dorsey's first tweet recently sold for nearly $3 million, Grimes getting millions of dollars for her NFTs, and digital artist Beeple selling his art for a record-breaking $69 million. And there is no signs that this is slowing down. So we have brought the one and only Republic Crypto Directors, Brian Mint and Graham Friedman back to talk to us all about NFTs, what are their applications, how you can get involved so you can get and be a part of everything that's going on. Brian and Graham, welcome to Profit to the People. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having us. So to get us started, we know NFTs now stand for non-fungible tokens, but what exactly does that mean and how does this actually work? Yeah, um, I can go ahead and get start this one off. Uh, just kind of like at its core, uh, Lisa, as you mentioned, NFT stands for non-fungible token, which is not the same as a fungible token. And I guess it's important to do a quick overview on what a fungible token is. Um, typically, when you think of like Bitcoin or Ether, or any of these major cryptocurrencies, they are fungible, which means they can be exchanged with each other. A non-fungible token is one where you cannot exchange it for another one. So people commonly think of the US dollar bill as something that's extremely fungible, like my dollar bill, Graham's dollar bill, and Lisa's dollar bill. If we all just traded it, it's the same. But if I had a NFT and Lisa had an NFT and Graham had an NFT and we traded them, they would actually all be very different things. So non-fungible tokens are uh, tokens that are unique and kind of like they pioneer a new way of thinking in which you can create digitally scarce goods or digitally unique goods. So, you know, one of the major applications, which I'm sure we're going to get into is artwork, right? You can um, create a piece of art these days and then mint it as an NFT so that your art now has a one of one digital representation. And that is represented as a token on the blockchain. Yes, people can right click and save this image and have a copy of it, but it will never be the same as the original one that's minted by the artist. So um, that's kind of like how I like to think about NFTs as a very primary application and a good way to frame it as a unique token. But I'm not sure, um, Graham, as an actual artist yourself, you might have some interesting perspectives or ramifications on how it applies to art and other things. Yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely chime in there. I think we're we're at the beginning of the curve with NFTs. To me, I would say they represent the object permanence layer of the metaverse. Um, and what I mean by that is that we are entering a world uh, where servers um, maintain entire alternate universes, right? That's the concept of the metaverse. And let's say I enter any sort of space and I want to have this piece of art that I can put up. Maybe I have this guitar in my virtual world. I would have an NFT that represents that guitar. Then when I go into any virtual world, I can take that with me. It basically pings my wallet. Um, in crypto worlds, wallets are IDs, right? They're our identity. So as I move my wallet from one digital world to another, it would essentially look at what do I hold? What sort of ownership and property is there? And then it would manifest it digitally. So I could take this guitar with me wherever I go. And that's sort of what it means by non-fungible, right? It represents a single thing. But, you know, maybe later in a more advanced digital realm, you know, it's my chair that I sit on. It's the clothes that my avatar is dressed in, my glasses, my hat. So again, it's really about digital ownership um, and being able to take things across what I would call the meat space, cyberspace divide, right? As we start to live a life that goes between digital and uh, normal world, um, this really helps us cross over with our property. 
Got it. So one of the things that I like to think about is in terms of physical art collecting. So anyone can buy a Monet print, but only one person can own the original. And that's what NFTs are designed to do, to give you something that can't be copied, which is the ownership of the original work. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to kind of add to that, like, there, there kind of begs the question, like, how do you know which one's like the original one, right? Like, oh, yeah, it's very clear. You know, if you have the original Monet, it's probably either signed or documented or certified some way in the real world. But in crypto, you know, all that information is stored on blockchain. And you can kind of look into the metadata. You can look into like when and where that specific NFT was minted by what contract address and things like that to verify the owner of that. Because like, yeah, there might be two people that try to mint, you know, the Nyancat image or something like that, right? But only one is like verified as the one that's created by the original owner of the Nyancat or something like that. And that's all done and all that metadata is stored on blockchain. So whenever you send it to different places, like Graham mentioned, you take it with you to different pieces of the metaverse, like that metadata stays with that NFT and it can always be verified um, by querying the blockchain. So it's like a just a digital way to represent this like certificate of authenticity. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and just I did really read quickly. about a, a, like a fake NFT being sold for more than 300K um, recently. So it's like, is there still a possibility of people selling unauthorized copies or fake NFTs? <laughs> it's digital. Um, as you see the internet, there's all sorts of opportunities to be taken advantage of and to scam. Truthfully, if you're going to go so hard as to say, you know, drop 300,000, it might be worthwhile just to consult somebody who can actually look at the records and say, you know, this is actually valid or this is pointing towards absolute nothingness. Um, beyond that, you know, there's a really important realization. The NFT token, technically speaking, is actually just a, a pointer, right? It points to a piece of information. It, it represents ownership to that. But if that piece of information, let's say the image, sits on Amazon web servers and it goes down, do you actually own it? Is it, you know? Um, so it is very important to think a little bit deeper beyond that. Is it stored on a decentralized data place um, where, again, you know, its, um, its authenticity can be defended? Or is it just up in the clouds? There was a really great art piece. So in crypto and, and general world, we would call being scammed, getting rug pulled, right? They pull the rug from out of your feet, under your feet. Uh, there was a really fantastic one where they sold a bunch of NFTs. And after they sold them, they replaced all of the images with pictures of rugs. Uh, thought it was very funny. And, you know, the artist was like, understand the tech um, before you really deploy a lot of money into it. You know, just like even investing in other cryptocurrencies or sending money over the internet, um, it's probably good to like double check uh, and try to have some understanding of what you're doing. So can technically anything digital be sold as an NFT? Good question. Probably. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the idea, yes, something digital can be sold as an NFT, but it's important to realize that the importance of leveraging NFT technology is because you want to prove authenticity of ownership of something, or you want it to be like kind of some level of uniqueness or scarcity. So if you're trying to sell something that maybe has like infinite copies or is meant to be truly democratized um, and free access for all, then maybe NFTs are not the way to do it. Uh, but if you're trying to kind of limit the access to it, say you're trying to create a you know a specific online club, you know maybe a DAO, and you want to limit the access to that, um, it can be done through minting a certain amount of NFTs. But there's an argument to be made that it could be used through standard uh, fungible tokens as well. So it really depends um, on the mechanism in which you want the community to be built and also the utility that you want the token to have. So uh, those are things that we actually do advise many of our clients on. Uh, we do a lot of uh, brainstorming and thinking along those lines uh, because, yeah, it is, it is a hard question, right? Like, do I NFT everything or do I just NFT some things? The technology is still written pretty new. So we're still exploring what are the proper use cases. Again, it doesn't have to be art. That's where we are right now. Um, NFTs have been around for a very long time. We were discussing them with a lot of clients back in the 2017 cycle. You know, it's really just a different codec uh, for the token. But, you know, I hold many token or sorry, NFTs uh, from years past that were from events, right? Uh, we went to conferences and basically the way you logged in was when you paid for it, they sent an NFT to your wallet. You would open up your wallet, say, here's my NFT. It was a proof of uh, entry. And think about like, you know, Woodstock tickets. Uh, nowadays, as uh, they kind of age, 
people are like, oh, you were there? That's really cool. Um, and then, of course, you can add game theory on top of it. So maybe anybody who went to, uh, let's say, RepublicCon uh, 20, I don't know, 2010, uh, we could start, you know, to gift them because we have a record of who holds these tokens. So maybe, you know, you want to reward and build on current NFT owners. I mean, it's a it's a whole world that, that can be built out and expanded upon. Um, again, I, I'm really enamored by the thought of uh, doing some real world crossover, but basically you're taking like the Supreme model of, again, having a community that really wants a scarce asset. Um, you know, Brian and I talked about this over and over again. It's all comes back to community um, and being able to build some hype around them and give them something that they find to be interesting. In the case of NFTs, it really unites the community um, by having some sort of shared ownership over an art series or maybe access to some sort of unique um, content concert, something fun like that. But, you know, we're, we're in phase 0.5 of, I think, the evolution of NFTs. And, and we will see some really interesting experimentation go on as we move forward. Awesome. So then when we think about just uh, from a someone who's new, why you've touched upon a few factors, why someone might want to own an NFT. Can people make money on that? Are there other types of value that people are really deriving from it primarily? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think probably the biggest reason why a lot of people are looking at NFTs is because of the, you know, large, excessive amounts of capital flowing into this space. Uh, and that's necessarily, you know, that actually comes back to community, what Graham was mentioning, right? Like you can, any of us can launch our collection of NFTs and put them out there. But the value of it is a is a factor of, I would consider like three things, um, the quality of the art, the quality of the community that's purchasing the art, and then any other, you know, supplemental benefits such as access, exclusivity that come with it. So that being said, like people pay to have memberships into certain clubs, think of like Soho House or something like that, um, in the same way that people pay to have, get access into Board Ape Yacht Club or MonkDAO or any other of these like NFT based communities. And um, I think these are kind of like the primary applications that we're seeing of NFTs these days, where you get access into a certain community by owning an NFT that is that gets you access. The NFT serves as like a virtual VIP ticket to get you in. And yeah, people pay for that kind of stuff. And what are they paying for? They're paying for that level of exclusivity. They're paying for the information that's circulating in these circles, right? So like, being a part of this club means that you're with other like-minded people and uh, from like a human, like mental uh, relationship status, like they want to talk to other people that are like-minded and they share information. So people, you know, typically say there's like alpha that's being shared, like, oh, what trades are good to make? What NFTs are good to get into? What's like some good market strategies? So there's money to be made with the information that exists in these NFT communities and people are willing to pay to get into them. So that's like one application where there's potential to be uh, to make money. And I think the other one also is just like purely on the art side of things, right? Like um, Beeple is a really good example where people are purchasing um, his uh, artwork because it's got messages, it's very interesting. Um, and he himself has been like putting out art on a very regular basis, right? To support the artists as well. So there's many different ways where people can be a part of these communities or support NFT artists. And there's lots of financial upside um, to these things, um, at least currently. I, I would like to add, and I'll, I'll be a, I'll die on this hill. Um, everything going on in, in blockchain, or as we're starting to call it more so Web3, um, is really about deconstructing the concept of value how we look at it, I would say money fits inside of value. Um, and when value starts to be streamed at the same rate that data is currently streamed today, I actually think the concept of money will die. Um, and you know, we're already starting to see communities, and this is happening with Axie Infinity in the Philippines, that prefer to spend simple love potions. Axies are like little Pokemon, um, and you use simple love potions to make them breed and have, have more little Axies. Um, and vendors are starting to accept SLPs, as they're called, um, because the community has rallied and they they love this thing. And they're like, you know what? Our set of value, we would prefer to have it in the Axie world than maybe in my bank account. Um, and I think we're just going to see that compound. And as we move further and further into the concept of digital value that streams, that has so many different formats. I mean, again, you know, we're looking at to talk about money is kind of like outdated and we're going to continue to move farther and farther where, you know, people might prefer to have a board ape than a house. And that's literally the conversation that's happening right now. Hmm. That is and wild so, to think about. Yeah. That's crazy. 
So like, if I kind of think about it, I, I started um, exploring some different communities um, where there were more women involved. So a couple that I found were like women in weapons. Um, yeah. There's like Alpha Girl Club, which is focused on like mental health and art and community. Um, there was one about Crypto Coven, which is about witches. So you get like witch NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like the way that you think about it, it's almost like, okay, to the, the Crypto Coven community of witches, they would use their value and they'd be like, the witch is more valuable to me than money, than like the bored ape means nothing to me and vice versa. So is, is that kind of like how you're thinking about? Yeah, 100%. And let's also, let's break down how the technology works, right? Let's say, what is there a currency for this coven? That's awesome, by the way. I haven't heard of it. But uh, <laughs> um, like, I, I just something? started exploring, so I, I can't answer that right now. Cool. So, you know, just to break it down, um, blockchain takes all of these assets and makes them somewhat exchangeable, uh, could be fungible. But even if it's an NFT, you would sell it for X amount of ETH, right? If you in this coven um, think that's really cool, that's where the like-minded ladies are, you're going to acquire more of that asset. And then, of course, if you had to pay your bills um, and it's all connected by blockchain, you could sell a fraction of it. It would move and it would pay the bills, right? So at some point, you're now living in this new asset, this new value set, um, because when you do need to make a payment, it can just be dumped into stable coins, Ethereum, Bitcoin, who knows what we actually pay bills with. Um, and when blockchain becomes this deeply proliferated, again, it doesn't matter. It's where does your value sit? And when you need to transact it, you'll just take it from that one pool, you'll move it to another. But you will see, again, um, if you're in punks, you're going to be like, I'm going to hold the punks. Um, uh, same with, you know, maybe it's a DAO, um, which is just more of a community. It's like a business run on the internet. Uh, they'll hold their value there because they're like, this is what I'm using to generate more value. This is where my belief structure is. And then, of course, when I need to make a payment, that's exactly what blockchain does. It just takes value from here, moves it there. Maybe it's changing into like 10 different currencies. I don't know. Um, but that's really the maturation that we're seeing happening right now. So this is like a present thing, not even a future thing. Mm -hmm. So then how does someone know which ones to join? What are some questions they should be asking? Follow your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Really, that is like, you know, a lot of people have been asking Graham and I, like, how do I get into crypto? How do I get exposure into NFTs? You know, I, I really just point them towards like, go play around in different Discord communities or look at different Twitter profiles of projects that you like and see if the conversation that's happening there is interesting to you, right? So, uh, for example, um, a really interesting uh, Discord community. This isn't really NFTs, but there's one called Friends with Benefits where their access is gated by a fungible token called the Friends with Benefits FWB token. And in there, they just like chat about life. They chat about music. They chat about, mu uh, they chat about sports, trading, et cetera. And it's all kind of like like-minded people that are like, yeah, they like crypto, but they also like having fun and having a, a forum to talk. So like that's a very general purpose one. Or if you want to join a community that's specific to traders, or one that's literally about art. So for example, there's one called um, OniForce, which is a, a drop that happened on Ethereum and you get an NFT that represents an avatar and you go in there and you can actually role play as your avatar in the chat, right? It's actually really cool. You can, you know, for those that like to have that suspension of disbelief, kind of escape reality, they can go in the Discord and pretend to be their avatar and be with other like-minded people and you can kind of just live in this fantasy world, sort of like a Dungeon Dragons kind of feel and be with other like-minded people. So there's really something out there for everybody. Um, you just got to go and explore different communities out there and see which ones um, speak to you. So that's a long way of saying follow your heart. <laughs> and so you can get into those discords without having to immediately buy uh, an NFT. Typically. So yeah, a lot of those discords you can get in them without the NFT, but a majority of those channels are actually gated if, uh, for when you do have the NFT. So you can like be in part of the general chat and like talk to people, but you'll notice that if you do have the NFT and you verify your ownership through the Discord bots, then more of the Discord is open up to you. And that's where all the cool stuff is. And I think that's also another very valid point as to where the value comes from. Maybe you have this NFT and it's not about, I bought it at $1, or I sold it at five. It's about access, right? I show this at the door to the club and they let me in. The club might be Discord because we're living in a highly digital world. The club might be the club. Um, all of it, it's really, again, this meat space, cyberspace divide. This allows us to have these ownership tokens that we can take with us anywhere. 
Um, we can show them off however we want. If I had a screen, I could fire them up there and, you know, maybe they do some cool movement. Um, but at the same time, it comes back to community. It comes back to shared value sets. And um, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things is uh, the younger generations already live in this world. So it's not even like crazy or strange. Awesome. And so, Graham, you've you've sold a few of your own NFTs. Um, so yes. how, how does someone mint one? How does, can anybody do it? Uh, who, who should be thinking about it? Yeah, absolutely. So I am, I am, but a, a lowly person on the, the art selling side, but I have indeed sold some, I would say the process is quite simple. Uh, the platforms are increasingly becoming, um, you know, smoother user interfaces, more accessible in general. Uh, so whether it be OpenSea, which is the dominant one on Ethereum, Rarible, which is really cool because Rarible is fully decentralized. It's governed by a DAO, again, sort of um, a community with an economic spine down the center. Uh, and, you know, there's a slew of others. Different chains all have their different marketplaces. But you can go on there. You can um, basically upload your art. And then it kind of comes down to there's sort of a, a creative process to how you're going to sell it. Are you going to actually attach some sort of IP that maybe gets destroyed in the real world? Do you destroy the actual file, right? That's not existing except for the digital one. You know, gamification of how do you create the scarcity? You know, I use, uh, I'm a photographer by, by actually my background. Um, so it's all digital files. People haven't even seemed really concerned if I maintain, you know, the digital file or not. They just kind of like it and they want to collect it. You know, I've seen other artists uh, doing a variety of different things. But in a nutshell, you can go to these platforms. It's getting easier and easier. There used to be a problem around gas fees that you had to pay. Uh, to put it on the marketplace, and that became really onerous and expensive. Um, and increasingly so, they built methods to maybe, you know, the buyer will cover that and, and things of that nature. That's called lazy minting, but it's actually a really amazing feature. Uh, so to anyone that's curious, um, you know, you can actually, the process of taking a piece, as long as it's digital, of course, um, and uploading it um, is not overly complex. I would say the real truth is that just like traditional art, I find it to be a cult of personality and you do need to have a community. So artists that were big on Instagram had no problem translating that. They had a following, they had a passionate um, user base, but let's say you don't have that, I would actually recommend that's the place to start is to try to you know, engage a conversation. People are opening discords, they're going into other discords. Again, it's, it's all about having that interest in people collecting it. Um, and you know, to some degree, there are even projects out there where the art is quite terrible. I think um, you net like it's not even a, a hot take, uh, but the communities are super cool, right? So there's a lot of different variants on it. There's really no rules and it's a highly experimental place. Almost the crazier you get with the, uh, the launch strategy, the better. So what are some, um, for people who have communities um, and are interested in this, what would you say are the first steps uh, perhaps to, from migrating, let's say they have a Slack community um, into actually creating one around uh, NFTs and um, you know, potentially even a DAO? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the first step is to go to these marketplaces and just get your hands dirty a little bit. You know, OpenSea is really big. It's on Ethereum though. Ethereum gas prices are quite expensive. I, I think Rarible is really cool because uh, they do have a DAO. You can get in there. You can actually like converse as to how the ecosystem is going to grow. So again, this is really interesting, right? Not only do you use it, but um, by being a participant, you might earn the token. The token gives you a governance vote. You can actually be influential into the growth of the product. Um, so beyond anything, just you know, try it out. Obviously, if you're coming with your digital art, they'll pretty much walk you through how to make a mint. It's, it's really the bread and butter of these businesses. Um, so it's not too complicated. I would like advise everyone to just dive in. It's um, it's, it's simpler than it is uh, one might assume. So, you know, going through that process, there's a variety of YouTube videos if you get really stuck, but their how-to sections are, are pretty straightforward. I think you'll pick that up really quickly. It's about, again, having that open conversation with your community, trying to get everyone really excited. The best thing that anyone can ever do is direct peer-to-peer -peer conversations. If I was a creator uh, and Brian was in my community, I'd probably start by just reaching out to Brian and creating a really true connection um, because even though this is all digital and very anonymous, it's, it's extremely human. It's peer to peer. And, um, that's at the end of the day, what is really, um, being yeah. wildly successful. Yeah. I mean, I would also add like to Graham's point, you know, you want to really engage the community 
And there's different ways to engage communities, like gamifying it. You can um, maybe even have a contest for the most active community members to get access to the presale or whatever. Like, I think whatever you do as a creator to like gamify or add a little bit of like more interesting um, models to the NFT drop or add layers of mystery. If you guys know the artist pack, he's always a little bit cryptic with the way that he um, drops his NFTs and things like that. Um, that all creates like a certain environment, certain um, level of interest that will help you with like your NFT sales. Cause again, it's like, yes, it's the art and the community, but there's also like this, like other element of like utility or mystery or how are you yeah, capitalizing? Yeah, exactly. Like, like <laughs> all these like little crazy things, right? Remind, remember that NFTs are a purely digital thing. So you can now start to like play with the fact that it is purely digital and use new and novel marketing ways, such as like airdrops or hidden, um, hidden features or, you know, rewarding past users with certain things and things like that. So being as creative as you can is really like the key to like kind of galvanizing your community and then leading to a more successful sale of your NFTs down the line as an artist. Cool. Do you, do you need to be technical in order to you know, create communities, create your NFTs? No, 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 I don't think so. You know, you gotta, uh, I guess, like understand crypto a little bit, like understand the, you know, what we we're talking about earlier, like what an NFT is, but you know, as a, Artists, you don't need to be super technical yourself. I don't know, Graham, you, you've, you've gone through the whole process, so I'm sure you have insight. Yeah, I, I mean, look, like if we're, <laughs> depends if we're talking about like my grandmother, maybe that's like we're getting a little bit too, but if, if you understand Web2, I think you're in a perfectly fine place. Um, I have a friend, I'll shout her out, Amber Vittoria. She's awesome. She's been a uh, illustrator for the longest time. We used to work together in the agency world and she's always crushed it, right? Has been doing large pieces in stores in New York City. She was on the kiosks in the NYC, but that's always difficult to translate into actual money in your pocket. And just, I, I've been following her journey. Um, you know, she's had a good community on Instagram and she's just been slowly trying to pull it in. Um, obviously there's been price discovery. She put pieces that were too expensive and everybody fell off, put pieces that were more accessible, but then everyone was like, oh, they're too accessible. So it was just sort of this balance, right again, paying attention to your community, reaching out to them. Um, you know, a lot of this digital world in the metaverse comes down to role playing. Uh, as Brian sort of mentioned, everyone really wants to do something interesting. So if you can build a story around it, um, you know, a lot of the projects that I fall into are purely narrative based. I looked at their website. I love the little story that they're, they're uh, piecing together. You know, maybe if you get this, then it builds into that and then this happens and suddenly you're in a whole world. Um, that kind of stuff I think is the greatest driving factor. Um, obviously art's always about storytelling, so is marketing, so is so much of what we do in this world. Um, so I think a good story will drive you far. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's there's, there's no rule, there's no playbook. Um, so everyone's doing things differently and kind of lean on what your skill set is and um, just, you know, people are here to support you. Ignore the haters because it's the internet, there's gonna be plenty. Um, and just keep moving. That would be like my core advice. Brian, as a collector yourself, any particular ways that you're vetting out things that you like? Yeah, definitely. I think like as a collector, you know, I, I care a lot about, you know, the activity of the, the team that's uh, putting it out. And this is actually kind of an interesting battle because like sometimes the teams are anonymous, sometimes the teams are not. So <laughs> there's different ways to gauge both both of them. I mean, eventually I'll just lose on a community, but I think we've beat that point um, all the way down. Uh, but essentially, you know, I want to make sure that the founders or at least the main people that are in charge or the ones that are seeing the community are active and they're showing commitment levels um, to this NFT project. Very similar to 2018, 2019, when Graham and I were saying, if you're going to launch a token, make sure that you're ready to maintain this token ecosystem because it's a little mini economy that you're putting together. Same thing, if you're going to launch an NFT project, that NFT project is your little ecosystem of collectors. Um, it's almost like a little economy of people that are looking to like trade and acquire your assets. So as the founding team, you have to at least seed the network with some sort of activity, some layer, some layer of utility um, and some roadmap that, you know, get people excited about what's to come. You know, there could be a future in which the founding team dissolves into a DAO and then like, the DAO ends up like taking over the management of the project. 
but that DAO needs to have a certain level of momentum leading up to its formation in order for it to be successful. So when I think about projects to collect, I think about, you know, what does the future of this project look like? You know, are the founding team members, um, do they seem committed? And is a community that they're building, you know, joining for the right reasons, as in they're joining to be a part of this community, they join it because they like the art. And then the, the level of conversation that's happening is not just around like what the floor price is or what the economic value of the token is, but it's people that are like interested in the lore of the token or interested in maybe even just like having other side conversations, right? Is this a place where community members hang out to talk to each other to like hang out or are they hanging out to talk to each other to like make money? So you can really gauge that based on like the quality of communication you see in the Discord. And uh, those are the main factors that I really focus on when I figure out what communities to join. And, you know, just just like a really quick tidbit of, I guess, knowledge would be, it doesn't take much work to see how much work the founders are putting in, right? If you go to their chat rooms and you see that they're extremely active, a lot of these people are not sleeping, right? It's like 16 hour days. They're very responsive, um, really good signals. Uh, if you want to get more technical and deeper, you can see, you know, if you find like one address is selling all the work and you think it's like the founder address, it's like, all right, this is really sketchy. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be there. So like a good founder, um, uh, same in the other crypto projects might lock up their value capture. Uh, you know, so saying like, I need to hit a certain level of commitment. A lot of time it's time-based or that they're willing to sacrifice some of their upside so that they're not just going to take the money and get out. These are all things that you can sort of sniff test. And a lot of times you'll go into these communities and you'll see the person and you can tell they're working hard. And then, you know, that's value generation, right? That's what we're looking for. Awesome. 100%. So we've we've really touched upon, you know, the use cases of art, collectibles within communities. What are some use cases beyond these? Yeah. Um, one that I've like been, you know, I think guest top of mind for recently, people that hold um, ENS domains. Uh, they recently did an airdrop uh, for people that have these domains. And I think what a lot of people don't know is that these uh, ENS, which stands for Ethereum Naming Service domains, are actually NFTs. So uh, you can have, you know, your name dot ETH as like a URL of sorts. And that's where people can send uh, crypto to, uh, you know, they're starting with ERC-20 tokens and then they're expanding out to others. But it's an easy way to, instead of like having your 0x um, alphanumeric wallet address as your wallet ID, it can be an ENS domain, which is a human readable. And those are unique to the specific users. And what do we remember about digitally unique things that we talked about earlier in this podcast? You know, it's a perfect application for NFTs. So um, using NFT technology to map one-to-one -one wallet addresses and relationships between these like unique URLs to wallet addresses is a really cool use case. Um, and, you know, ENS was using NFT technology years ago uh, before uh, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club and the, all the art that we're talking about these days. And that's like a really cool use case. Um, another one that I think um, I've been seeing a lot of is using uh, NFTs to as like actual like ticket, concert ticket uh, trackers. You know, it's a really cool way to, you know, digitally track ownership um, and digitally track the authenticity of tickets. It really kills two birds of one stone. You get rid of the fraud and then you also make it all digital, which is easier to track and um, easier to like transact with and things like that. So aside from just like, you know, aesthetics of art and profile pictures, like there's a lot of ways that you can um, use NFTs uh, outside of like what is most popular today. And I think we're still scratching the surface. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at Republic right now, we're exploring IP rights on in NFT format, right? You know, we're working with clients that want to take that same idea uh, if you own a piece of IP, why not have it be represented digitally? Not only can we um, track it better, but obviously we can then build tooling on top of it um, to see all of its engagements and do like, you know, business intelligence tool sets. Obviously, I think there's a lot of validity in like supply chain. Anytime we really want to represent just like a, a singular item, I have a bunch that just get me into chat rooms, right? It's not, I don't show it off. But I like the chat room. If, if I wanted to let Brian enter, I could send him the NFT. Uh, I would not be able to participate for a little while, but maybe I want to loan him my access. You know, and then from there, I, as I said in the beginning, I think everything that we view as items that we own in our digital parallels, the metaverse, will be represented by an NFT. So if I go get a cup, if I have this cup of coffee, you know, I'll have a coffee cup NFT and I'll be able to take it in. And if I sell it, 
it'll be gone. Uh, and then, you know, it just compounds from there. So it, it also the fact that they don't disappear allows brands, you know, to really touch other communities. Let's say everyone goes to an event. It's some new music, musical artist. Um, they end up blowing up. Let's say Lady Gaga at the beginning of her career, she could end up rewarding everybody when she's super famous uh, at the end of her career with a private concert for only those who participated in the beginning. Right. There's all sorts of like fun game mechanics that we can start to play, um, not only when we have this crossover between the digital and the real, but also just the permanence of blockchain that these things remain forever and ever. Um, so it's really fun. You know, communities can cross pollinate. We're seeing a lot of that um, where people are launching maybe social media apps and they're like, we want the board Ape community. Let's just airdrop them access to our application. Um, you know, there is this very interesting thing in Web3 where in Web2 you would spend money for marketing. Um, in Web3, your money is your marketing, right? You give it away and suddenly those people have access to something and they become your community. So we're really in a very playful part of time. Um, there's a couple artists who try to NFT like their genetic code, um, all sorts of fun experimental stuff. It's, it's really a, a mishmash of, of digital data layers right now. So, I mean, we're going to see all sorts of really fun things. There's a lot of games coming out right now. I would say like as of this weekend, uh, that are mixing NFTs with sort of decentralized finance, you know, where maybe you have an NFT character and it produces some sort of asset and they all begin to interact. And suddenly you have this like very lively game that people can not only play, but generates some sort of value. Again, could be cashed out for money, could stay in that world. Sky's the limit. We're in a really fun time. I think we're going to see explosive growth. Uh, so just, you know, hold on. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Uh, and I think we're all going to be surprised probably with some of the innovations that we see coming our way. Yeah. So one one of the things you mentioned was uh, the airdrops. Can you talk a little bit about NFT airdrops and like how exactly does that work? Sure. Yep, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's a couple different ways, right? An airdrop is essentially just taking a digital asset and putting it into people's wallets. We've seen this happen with cryptocurrencies in the past, where for a variety of reasons, they want to give it away. Some people are like, it increases decentralization to have more owners. Um, other people, it could be a governance token, right? We're going to build a DAO. So if we give away the ability to vote, we have more people that can then come in and vote. And suddenly we have a, a, a more tight knit community. Um, this has impact on your legal defense as a utility as well. Some people just want to do cool things. Uh, Brian and I have a few wallets that just have random pieces of artwork in there. And you're like, okay, someone airdropped this to me. Um, and some of them could be really silly. Maybe they're a little bit lewd and it's sort of like a, yeah. a dirty joke, right? But in a nutshell, you know, <laughs> we are seeing that people will airdrop things to these communities that have re reached a certain critical mass. And that's basically the same as what any brand would want to do, right? If I was going to sponsor, uh, I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh, so a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, uh, you know, a brand could go to a Pittsburgh Steelers game and just literally advertise there. Why are they doing that? Because they want that community. Um, you can do the same exact thing by airdropping uh, whatever it is that you have directly into the wallets of said community. So it's not even like that crazy different from traditional marketing. You you have this very clear set of like who is in this community and we want to give them access. Hopefully that community can become ours and we can grow. Um, but there's a lot of reasons to airdrop. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's sort of a, a really broad subset. I don't know. Maybe there's something I missed, Brian, if you want to add in there. No, it's not nothing you missed. I think like a commentary that I have on airdrops, you know, as Graham mentioned, it's like it is just a way to get your token or your NFT into the hands of wallets. Um, I feel like we might be reaching a point where airdrops are so overused by, you know, projects that are looking to get exposure that it's almost like equivalent of like junk mail sort of. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes there's like a lot of um, unsolicited airdrops where you just get them just for being a part of some community and you might not even want them. So, you know, A, yes, it is good if you're an artist and you want to get your tokens or your art in the hands of a certain community. It's like, oh, you know, I want my artwork to be airdropped to owner to people that hold this type of NFT, which is great. But what if those people in that community don't really care about your art or don't even want it? Like it's um, kind of this problem that we're seeing these days where people that are in communities um, just get a bunch of airdrops, which is like kind of nice in the beginning, but now you kind of have stuck with a lot of potentially um, worthless art or worthless files. So airdrops kind of a hit and miss thing. Uh, you know, we do have projects that we work with that are looking to air, do airdrops. And I think like at its core, doing an airdrop is a really novel blockchain native way 
to get exposure for your project. You just got to do it carefully, you got to do it thoughtfully, maybe give people a heads up, maybe give people ability to opt into the airdrop. How do you earn your way into an airdrop? You know, there's like things you can do to really play around with it versus just doing like a blind airdrop to certain people. So, you know, I think Lisa, to answer your question about these airdrops, like, yeah, you know, people do all the time, but like, just as it is in most, you know, areas of technology, like just doing it thoughtfully and doing it in a very smart and creative new way is to what is the, the way to like make your airdrop stand out and in turn make your art stand out as well. So in terms of just where we are now, um, I mean, we started this off, Graham, you were saying it's still really early um, in the cycle. Where, where do you see all of this going? Sure. So I guess you use the word cycle, which changes things because uh, we do see this to be pretty cyclical, right? Uh, bull market, bear markets, um, you know, that actually leads to a very interesting concept, which is maybe we've gotten to a big enough point that there's cycles within the cycle. Um, you know, I always ask, like, are we in a multi-sector crypto world now? Um, in the last bull market, you were kind of in or you were out. You were in these highly speculative cryptocurrencies didn't have much backing. Um, there wasn't much you could do with them except to exit to like a cash position. Now, a lot of them have all sorts of yield bearing capabilities. So they're very cool. If you believe in the community that you're in with NFTs, it's like, just because Bitcoin dumps, does this mean that Board Ape is going to go down? I truly don't know. Uh, if it buys you real world access to cool things, why would that value drop in Bitcoin? It doesn't really make sense. Um, so in terms of like the current cycle that we're in, um, really hard to tell. That one's obviously like a speculative guess, and I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a magician. However, in the grand scheme of things, we have seen NFTs really come into their own. They're being utilized. We're talking to people, you know, that want to give them away at con concerts. You know, basically be like everyone in uh, section A, like rows, whatever, whatever, can scan this QR code and they'll get a free hot dog right now, right? Like that's not even a crazy use case. Um, but we can start to start, or you can see the foundations that we can build on. Again, ownership, we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, so maybe your um, some some securities, some future ownership representations could happen. Um, it, it takes away a lot of frictions, right? The blockchain allows us to transfer value very easily. Um, so you do get all of those advantages. And, uh, you know, from there, I, the, the, the reason I enjoy this so much is because I get to sit back and watch my my mind just gets uh, exploded by all of the crazy cool innovations. So it happens so often and so fast that for me to sort of speculate is tough, but I, I really do think we're in a very flexible, fluid place where uh, creators can let their freak flag fly. And that's gonna be the most fun thing is to not guess what's coming, but actually just be surprised by the amazing things that happen. Awesome, Brian, any thoughts? No, I think, I think Graham said it best. You know, I think like one of the cool aspects of this NFT revolution is that NFTs have brought the retail masses into crypto. And with that, it's like the creatives are in here. And when the creators are in, you know, there's like not really a limit to like how creative people can get if they're limit, if they're literally limited by their imagination in the digital world, right? So there's a lot of um, ideas and explorations that I'm just really looking forward to seeing. You know, I'm not like an artist by any means. So I'm just here to like see what the artists are going to come up with. And the fact that there's a lot more retail people in and not just like the traditional like engineers and developers that it was a few years ago, which is also great, by the way. But like now there's just a completely new, fresh set of minds here to innovate on the existing technology. And like, yeah, you know, they're still learning what crypto is. They're still learning how to use blockchain technology and Web3. So I think like the next few years are going to be pretty crazy on, in terms of like what type of um, new, innovative ways we're going to see people implement um, this like digitally native technology. Yeah. And that, I mean, that already starts to answer the last question I wanted to ask, which was how do you see NFTs bringing profit back to the people um, and all around, uh, even just this idea of diversity, they said, you know, diversity of minds, diversity of people who are coming into the ecosystem um, and what's, what that's going to do to transform the entire ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I think like NFTs definitely will be bringing profit back to the people. Uh, it, especially for artists, you know, this is just a completely more fair and open way for them to monetize on their artwork. Another thing that we didn't really get to touch on on this podcast is play to earn gaming, where a lot of the assets in these play to earn games are represented as NFTs. But this is a really interesting paradigm shift because in play to earn games, the players are 
owning a part of the game, which is the NFT characters, versus in the past, you pay the game publisher to get access to play the game, and then that's kind of it. So in this new um, GameFi or play-to-earn gaming world, uh, profit is given back to the people because the people own more assets in the game. So that's a new revolution that NFTs have allowed for users um, in the gaming world as well. So like, there's a lot of these kinds of themes that you're seeing where uh, everyday people or the retail users are able to be have just like a more ownership stake in the platforms or verticals that they participate in versus in web two, you know, it's like companies that own these platforms and users pay to play it. And then that's kind of it. So uh, we're definitely entering this phase where the profit is going back to the people and the people have more of a um, ownership stake or kind of like vested interest in the success of what they're participating in. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, play to earn is really cool. It's obviously a good entry, right? You have a game and, and people play it and they earn. I I'll be super thrilled when we, I want to see learn to earn. That's going to be like far out. What if you get an education and the process of it actually pays you like, woohoo. Um, but, you know, in terms of profit to the people, I would say there's like two things that NFTs are just slaying. Uh, one is distribution. You no longer need a middleman to help you with distribution. Um, the blockchain handles this. It's open source. It's free for everybody. Um, so anyone can build applications that help an artist distribute their artwork to their community or to receive funds or do, you know, anything in the middle. But suddenly you're taking away that middleman that has played such a vital role in value capture that doesn't make it to the artists themselves. Right. Um, and then secondly, this is a super killer feature of NFTs is that whoever mints the NFT brings it forth into the world. Um, which should be the artist, will get uh, recurring royalties on each sale that happens for the rest of time. So that is mind-blowing to say that if I sell it to you and you sell it to Brian and blah, 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 I continually get a tiny percent. It's like, well, you can actually set it. It's up to the artist. And let's just say it's 2%. I've seen you know developers taking 6%. It's mind-blowing. Um, every time that thing gets sold, rather than, again, I sold it to Lisa, uh, you don't make all of the money for selling it to Brian, you'll make a lot of it, but I'll at least get a tiny slice since I am the person who crafted the original. That is super huge. Um, it you know opens you up to recurring revenue streams, which at the end of the day, give you sort of a, a freedom from time poverty, allow you to live your life in a little bit more of a robust way um, and ascend the social ladder, which I think is hugely important and has been really difficult. Uh, for artists who traditionally don't get paid very well. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I think those are really, really big uh, feature sets. Very cool. And super important last points to, to get across. So for everyone that's listening, I hope that this episode was helpful. Brian and Graham are the experts, in-house experts at Republic. And hopefully this episode made crypto a little more accessible, made NFTs more understandable and empowers you, especially if you are a creator, an artist, or someone who's always been interested in this world to see how you could potentially profit and create access and do so much more with this new technology. So if you have uh, any other questions, you can always check out the show notes for references to everything we talked about today. Brian and Graham, thanks again for all of your knowledge and wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This podcast is provided for educational purposes only by Republic and Republic.co. Nothing discussed should be construed as legal, tax, accounting, or investment advice. The views of the presenters may not be the views of Republic and its affiliates. Always consult with trusted professional advisors before making investments. Private investments are inherently illiquid and may result in a total loss. All rights reserved. <laughs>